Good morning. morning. It's been a couple of years since I've been able to worship with you here at, at Santa Clarita. And I'll tell you, it is just as enjoyable as I remembered it being. You have, um, you have a special congregation here, and I am impressed as I read and hear the reports of the things that you are doing in ministry. Um, just uh, know that you are serving Jesus as you do those things. Um, you can read about who I am and where I'm from in the bulletin. I don't need to uh, talk about myself. That's not why I'm here today. But I have a very long-standing um, personal tradition that I never preach without first talking to my Father. So if you'll just bow your heads with me as we pray, Father in heaven, it is so good to be in your house. You've given us a day to come and be with you. You've promised us a blessing, and you are a God who always keeps his promises. So Lord, today <laughs> we come to you confessing to you our sinfulness. Lord, we're not even what we want to be, much less what you desire for us to be. We are imperfect. We are vile sinners. We can't always see the vileness of our condition, for our hearts are desperately wicked. But Lord, we also come to you because we have a Savior, Jesus, who loved us so much that he emptied himself completely in order to reconcile us to you. Not only did he rescue us from death, but he gave us the righteousness that was his and took away our wretchedness. And so, not because of anything at all that we have done, but because of all that Jesus has done, we can come before you this morning to praise you and to thank you and with gladness in our hearts proclaim that you are our God and we are your children and that we love you. Please receive the worship that we offer you now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I want you to turn to the second of the scripture readings that we had this morning, Matthew chapter 18. It is a strange thing how we, the people of God, the children of the Almighty, have so grossly misunderstood a passage of scripture that we need to look at it this morning. It's about what happens if we have someone that sins against us. I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, I'm reading from the New International Version. I believe that the Pew Bible is the new NIV, but they ought to be fairly similar. Verse 15, if your brother sins against whom? This is not if your brother sins. This is not calling us to be the sin Gestapo. This is not us telling someone else how they should live their lives. This has to do with infractions against the reader. If your brother sins against you. Now it's really important that we understand that because Jesus is teaching us. And I believe that Jesus doesn't use words loosely. That Jesus means what he says. 
And it's also vitally important that we look at the context, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. He has been talking about the lost. He, he talks about the lost sheep. And so he is continuing here in chapter 18 of Matthew, and he says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If somebody wrongs you, if somebody misrepresents your character, if someone takes from you without your permission, or if someone borrows from you and does not repay, or if someone in some way steps on your toes, either figuratively or literally, go and talk to the person privately. Jesus doesn't say, get the gossip mill running. Jesus doesn't say, stir up as much contention as you can among your supporters and then gang up on the person who sinned against you. You go to them personally, privately, and say, I'm sure you did not intentionally mean to harm me. But when you did what you did, when you said what you said, it made me feel, and you fill in the blank. Someone can argue with you about what you say, but how you feel cannot be argued against. If I tell you, I feel hungry, you can say, well, look at you. Why are you feeling hungry? You've got several sandwiches stowed away there. In fact, a whole picnic basket full. But if I tell you I'm hungry, I know how I feel, and chances are you're not going to argue with me. If I say, I am really sad today, I'm talking about my experience. So if somebody has hurt my feelings, if someone has wronged me, and I go to them and I say, I, I'm sure you didn't intend this, but I'd like for us to be reconciled because when you did that, it made me sad. I feel that it has harmed the, the friendship that we've had, the harmony that has existed between us. And so Jesus says, if he or she, if she listens to you, you have won your sister or your brother over. What is the objective in all of this? Is it to say, you did that, and you are bad. You're a bad person. No, it is to say, the harmony that we have had is broken. I don't want that. I want us to be fixed. I want us to be reconciled. And if that person truly loves you, you've won them back. The, harm, the disharmony has been replaced by harmony. That is the goal. That is the reason for all of this. But, Jesus says, verse 16, if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that ever, every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. These are not people that you have handpicked to go to that person and say, we agree, you're bad. We agree, you're a terrible person. We agree, you are wicked. These are prayer partners. These are people that you choose to go and plead for harmony to be restored. Remember, whose teaching is this? 
This is Jesus. Does Jesus ever make mistakes? Ever? And so he says, take two prayer partners with you, maybe three, and go and plead with that person. Now, it could be that the person who has wronged you is very proud and willful and just can't admit that he or she made a mistake. So what do you do? Well, according to Jesus, you tell it to the church. What does that mean? Oh, let me tell you, church, about my former friend who did this or that to me, and I have been so wrong, I even took my witnesses with me and proven to that person that he or she is wrong. Why do you tell it to the church? You get the whole church praying for the resolution of the issue. Praying that harmony can be restored in the body of Christ. There is someone that the devil is really, really working on. We need to have a serious season of prayer for this person. But hardness of heart may continue anyway. And so Jesus says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now the reason that I say that we misunderstand this and completely misunderstand this is that we think when we treat them as a heathen or a tax collector, we get our garments away from even touching that vile person, we write them off, we disfellowship them from the church, and we say, you do not belong here anymore. Now, some of you are probably saying, who's that heretic guy that's up there telling us all of this stuff? Well, before you stone me, look at the context. I want to go back to the to the progression of the thought. But look at the context. Are you familiar with the term pericope? It's, it's in some, yeah, some of you are. I, I see a few people nodding their heads. Ever, other people are just staring in, in total disbelief. What's a pericope? You think you made a mistake. Yes. <laughs> it's spelled pericape, P-E-R-I-C-A-P-E. -E. But a pericope is what you call the little section between headers in your Bible. Now in mine, the parable of the lost sheep, a brother who sins against you, and the next pericope, the next little section, is the parable of the unmerciful servant. Okay, so right after Jesus' teaching that we've been t talking about, notice the next pericope. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? You see, the Jews said three times. First time, oh, you made a mistake. Second time, I'm warning you. And the third time, I've had it with you. We're disconnected. You're not with me anymore. Three strikes and you're out. So Peter is thinking, well, you know, the Bible has this whole seven thing, this whole number of perfection. So instead of three times... Let's go to seven. Hey, Jesus, have I got it right? Let's for, shall I forgive seven times? And Jesus answered. Now, the NIV misses this, but I'm going to read it the way it should be. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. The NIV says 77. No, 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 no. That's too legalistic. Jesus is saying, you can count to 77. What I want you to do is take that seven times you thought was good, and I want you to multiply that by 70. 
after 489 times of forgiving, Jesus doesn't say, oh, now you can finally not forgive. Because what do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Love keeps no record, what? Of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And what is the character of God? Love. Which means God isn't keeping score. And you know what else? God does not want his people to keep score either. Now that's the very next pericope from what we've just been looking at. So Jesus isn't saying, right off that no good sluggard. He says, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. What are we supposed to be doing with pagans and tax collectors? Now, folks, if you're following along, what was the first Scripture reading that we had of the two? Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. By the way, the Lord is the Lord and He doesn't change. Is that correct? Is that biblical? All right. So if the Lord says something in Isaiah, does He still mean it in Matthew? Yeah, He does. And so the Lord says, this is, I believe, instruction to Isaiah, but not just to Isaiah, but to all of God's people, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring them back, bring back those of Israel that I've kept. God says, yes, I want my lost sheep returned. Right? Is, is that fair? Is that what that says? It, it, I want my lost ones reclaimed. But he says, that's not enough. Because it's not just the lost sheep in the house. He goes on to say, I will also make you a light for whom? The Gentiles. Oh, those hated Gentiles. Those others. God loves them too. And God says, I want you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring what? You may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. God doesn't say, I only want certain people saved. God is not saying, if you happen to have the right mother and father, speaking at this time in, in history, if you happen to be born into the right group, I love you, I want you saved. But if you happen to be born outside, ooh, no chance. Jesus wants his prophets, his people, his children to be his light and to proclaim his plan of salvation to the Gentiles. Why does the church exist? Do we exist so that we can congratulate ourselves that we are the people of God? We are the remnant church. Hallelujah. Praise be to us. That is not why the church exists. The church is, according to the Apostle Paul, the body of whom? Christ. What did Christ do with his body while he was here? He gave of his time and his energy and of his very life in order to bring salvation to those who are lost. So what is the purpose of the church? Exactly the same thing. 
we exist to be a light to those in darkness. By the way, the Lord continues to in, inspire Isaiah along those lines, talking about those who dwell in darkness have seen a great light. What is it, the three angels' messages? The light that shines in darkness is Christ. The church is supposed to be pointing everyone to Jesus. It's not that the three angels' messages are unimportant. It is that they are one. One means of teaching the world about Jesus. Because whatever we believe, if it doesn't affirm Jesus, if it does not help people to love Jesus, if it doesn't bring us to embrace him, as Solomon would put it, it's chasing the wind. There is no purpose for the church other than to lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim. That's why we exist. We exist to say, we have this amazing God. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about the Savior that became my sin so that I could have his righteousness. Let me tell you about the grace of my Savior who does not hold my sins against me, but forgives me and clothes me with righteousness. And he wants to do the same thing for you. That's why the church exists. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 18 when Jesus says, if they don't listen when the church is praying for them, treat them as you would a Gentile or treat them as you would a tax collector or a pagan. Search your memory banks. How did Jesus treat Gentiles and pagans? I seem to recall that he loved them, that he ate with them, that he worked miracles on their behalf. Where do we get off thinking that this text, this teaching of Jesus, tells us to write them off? You see why it is so offensive to God when we take the very words of Jesus and use them in a way he never intended for them to be used. And now, in this context, we can understand what he says next. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. People have wrestled with that little binding and loosing phrase for a long time. But if you think of it in terms of the mission of the church, if we, if we fulfill our mission to lift Jesus before the people, not worrying about who they are, and I'm, I'm so thankful that you have this family thing where you're caring for the, the people who've really had the world come down hard on their shoulders. You're, you've, got, you've got the image. You've got the message there. Praise God for that. But if we write someone off as being unworthy of our time, and attention, and love, what have we done? We have bound them in their sin. Because we have not proclaimed to them the message of salvation. We've not been their light. We have not told them about the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. So we have bound them. In their ignorance, we have withheld from them the salvation that could have been theirs. 
So are we binding or are we loosing? Now you might say, I don't know, it's kind of sketchy logic there, Pastor. Well, go back just two chapters. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and it starts in verse 13. Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? By the way, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. Jesus refers to himself as the son of Adam all the time. He is the second Adam. He is the world's second chance. So who are the people saying that I am? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, Jesus says, all right, but who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up. Peter is quite impetuous. And so when I read of all of his rebukes, I get rebuked because I have a very similar character. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, You're blessed, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are stony. You are a stone. Stone could be a name, could be like a character in a, in a book, Stone Barrington, or it could be like an old television rodeo writer named Stony Burke. But Jesus says, you're a stone. But, lost my line here. Yes. But on this rock... I will build my church. Now, you've probably heard this many times. Peter is a nickname Jesus gave him. His name was Cephas or Simon. But Peter is Petros and it's a stone, a rock. You can could, you could say it was a pebble. You could say it was a rock. It could be uh, even something like that. You know, maybe a double handful size rock. But I don't know that I would want any kind of a building with no more foundation than that. What about you? I would want bedrock. I would want solid rock. I want the church to be built on Christ, the solid rock where I stand. But that's not just something that we say to counter those who say that Peter was the rock, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And now look at verses 3 and 4 of Deuteronomy 32. I will proclaim the name of Yahweh. Whenever you see LORD in all capital letters, that is where in the original text the divine name of God was used. Originally it was only four letters, all consonants. Later on the Masoretes came and added some points, some little, we call them diacritical marks, little points above and below and between the consonants of the old Hebrew so that it was easier to read. Imagine how hard it would be to read anything without vowels. Okay? So whenever you see Lord in all capital letters, it's the divine name. We think it's something like Yahweh, the eternal self-existent one. Okay? Now, back to the text. I will proclaim the name of Yahweh Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is our what? He is our rock. His works 
are perfect and all his ways are just. So it is very clear to the Hebrew mind that the Almighty, Yahweh Elohim, he is a rock. Now I could refer you to other places, um, Psalm 18 and verse 2, or to uh, 1 Peter, the second chapter, where Jesus is the cornerstone, referring back to Psalm 18, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Some call it capstone. A capstone is the finishing of the building. It's the foundation that Jesus is. He is the foundation stone. And Peter identifies him as such. So let's go back to Matthew 16. Jesus says, well, Peter, your confession that I am the Messiah is solid. In fact, it's rock solid. But a rock isn't good enough to be the foundation. I am the rock. I am the foundation for my church, and the gates of the grave will not prevail against it. I am so tired of hearing even Adventist pastors refer to the gates of hell as though it were the domain of Lucifer. This is the grave. Satan has no dominion anymore. The cross cured that. Jesus is saying, the church will be built on me. I am the foundation. I am the solid rock on which my church will be built. And even my death won't interfere. The gates of the grave cannot prevail against the advancement of the church. And so what does he say immediately after this, the same phrase we looked at in chapter 18? He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, there are many people in the world today, a sizable percentage of those who profess the belief in Jesus, who believe that the key is the ability to bind or to loose, that somehow Peter was given the key to eternal life. Well, what does the Bible say? It's not so much important what people think. What is important is what the Bible says. So let's go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. I need some time to get there also. So you can be turning. Chapter 11, and we're going to go to the nearly the end of that chapter. We're going to be looking at verse 52, and I want you to notice that Jesus is speaking. And he's talking to church leaders. Uh, that's a misnomer church officials. A church leader should be someone leading in the advancement of the gospel, right? That's the purpose of the church. If you are a church leader, you should be leading others in knowing Jesus, right? So these were church officials. Look, look what it says in verse 52. Woe to you, experts in the law, these are Bible scholars. 
They're experts in what Scripture says. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away what? The key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered others who were entering. Let's just take that and paraphrase it. Jesus says, you've got the key to your mission. The mission is being a light to the Gentiles. The mission is lifting high the cross. The mission is building the body of Christ. Your mission is to get people into God's kingdom. You've got the key. What is the key? The understanding of the Scriptures. He's talking to people who are experts in the Bible, right? Experts in the law. Torah is instruction. These are those who are wise in the instruction of the law, but what are they doing? They're not unlocking that knowledge to other people, and not only are they not using their wisdom to share with others, they're standing in the doorway. They have created a barrier so that those who want to get into the kingdom can't get by. And so back in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, not just to Peter, because his disciples are the ones, they're the living stones, as First Peter chapter 2 says, they're the ones who are building up the living temple of God. They're the ones who are bringing men and women and boys and girls into the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his salvation. He's saying, you have the key of knowledge. You have the knowledge of how we're saved. By the way, how are we saved? The Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear, does he not? Ephesians chapter 2, For it is by grace you have been saved. That sounds past tense, doesn't it? That doesn't sound like it's ongoing. Well, it is ongoing, but it is in the past. The cross was enough. Sorry. I'm... I'm hitting that with something and it's making a terrible noise. Sorry. It's not my stomach rumbling. It's something else. We have the knowledge of how to be saved. It is by grace that we're saved through faith and not of works lest anyone should boast. We are not saved by what we do, but by whom or what we love. Let that sink in. It's not what you do, it's who or what you love. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? If you do, your life will show it. If you say, I'm going to try to make this in a way that you can understand without totally crushing toes. If you say you love dogs, but every time you see one, you kick it in the belly. It doesn't really look like you love dogs. Now I'm going to step on your toes. And mine. Mine are closer, so I'm stepping on mine first. If we say we love God, but we can't get along with God's children... Maybe we don't love God either. If we say we want the character of God, which is love, 
but we don't want to love other people, then maybe we don't really love the character of God. If we love our stuff more than we love our Savior, are we even worthy of having a Savior? If our prestige and our power, limited as it is, our possessions and our ambitions are more important to us than the mission of Christ, then do we really love him? We're not saved by our works. We're saved by loving Jesus and allowing his loving character transform our lives. Now that can't be done easily. Because there's something about this sinful nature that we were born with that, I don't believe in zombies, but it's a zombie. It keeps coming back to life. The sinful nature that we, we plead for God to crucify, and yet we have these little vigils around its grave hoping that it will resurrect. It is by grace. It is strictly by the love of God for you and for me that we take a hold of by trusting in His promise. It's very simple. God made Him who had no sin to become sin for us that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. What did I have to do with that? Nothing other than choosing to love God. Now, back to the text. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you, the church, the knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. I will give to the church the knowledge of the love of our Savior. And then Jesus repeats that phrase, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What is binding? It's what Jesus said to the experts in the law. You've got the key, but you're blocking the door. You're not letting anyone in. You are taking the knowledge and you say, it's for me. It's mine. Instead of saving others by saying, it's for you too. This is so wonderful. It's for you too. Use your imagination for a minute. This is totally ludicrous, but I hope it'll help to illustrate the point. Let's say that every time you gave, let's just pick a number, five bucks. Every time you give five bucks to another person, it miraculously comes back into your pocket. The other person got the advantage of it, but you get it. Now, is that totally ludicrous? Didn't God do something similar with a widow lady's flour and oil? Okay? But if every time you gave away $5, that person was blessed, and you got your money back, how many of you would be giving your money away? It'd be like Christmas. This is fun. I can give away money. I can help people. And it didn't cost me anything. We'd do it then, wouldn't we? Because we are activated by something that works for us. But God says, you can give away the plan of salvation. Other people can have it. And you know what? It doesn't cost you anything. You get to still keep it. It's still yours. And so the question is, what is the church? 
doing with the key of knowledge? Are we binding people in their sins or are we loosing them from the power of death in the grave by teaching them that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Ah, when we put it that way, it's so easy, isn't it? What is the church doing? So we have to ask one more question. Who is the church? And I can tell you that all of you have seen the church this morning. Unless there happens to be someone here who is visually impaired, then maybe you haven't. But the rest of us, when we were brushing our teeth or some of us scrape our neck, or some others the face, or combing the hair or greasing the dome, whichever it is, we saw the church. Because who is the church? It's the person whose body you are walking around in. It's you. It's you. It's me. We are the church. So what is the church doing? What are you doing? Are you binding people in their sins? Or are you using the knowledge that God has given you to loose them from their sins and from the second death. The reason there are pastors is we are supposed to challenge you to think outside your comfort zone. If I don't ever challenge anyone to think outside their comfort zone, especially me, I'm wasting your time. So I don't want you to think that I believe I'm better than you. I am not. I am a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. And it's only Christ who deserves any glory or any praise. But God has called me to challenge your thinking, to think outside your comfort zone, and to try to decide, is God asking me to do something different? And I hope that you can answer that today you have been challenged to think in a new way. So the sermon title is, Are We Binding or Loosing? And only you know the answer to that question. But if you're binding, you can stop and begin loosing. Let's pray. Wonderful Father in heaven, the teachings of Jesus are just so awesome. Whatever I read of him, I stand amazed. He challenges me every day of my life to not be comfortable where I am. May I never be comfortable where I am. May I be confident of his love and grace but may I never be comfortable with where I am. May I always want to be closer to Jesus. I pray that I will point others to Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and I pray that everyone hearing this message will also accept the challenge to point people to our wonderful Savior, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.